Hey guys, I recently found a, a relatively inexpensive source of fluorinert on eBay. Uh, it's an unusual fluid that's used in electronics for cooling circuit boards. That's its main use. Uh, but this fluid has a lot of unusual properties that make it uh, interesting for experiments. So let me tell you about some of the properties and then show you what I did today. Fluorinert is a brand name for a saturated fluorocarbon. So you've heard of hydrocarbons, which is basically a carbon chain that is filled up with hydrogen atoms. So all the positions that a hydrogen atom can go um, are all taken on, these, on this carbon chain. Um, a fluorocarbon basically means that you replace all of these hydrogens with fluorine atoms. And in this case, it's a saturated fluorocarbon, sometimes called a perfluorocarbon, so meaning that all the spaces are taken up with fluorine. Uh, one possibility is that you could have a double bond between two of the carbon atoms and then you wouldn't have spaces for as many hydrogens or fluorines. This is an unsaturated uh, either hydrocarbon or fluorocarbon depending what's on on the ends of these bond links. And the properties of these are actually quite different especially for the fluorocarbons. So this is a very inert liquid and these tend to be quite reactive. So FC40 or fluorinert FC40 is a specific kind of uh, fluorocarbon, a saturated fluorocarbon blend that I think is made by a Dow or somebody like that. And they're a little proprietary about what is exactly in here. It's a blend of saturated fluorocarbons, probably 8 to 12 carbon long. Um, and they claim that it won't fraction, so that if you boil it, uh, you're, it's not supposed to change composition. But anyway, so the reason that they, they use a blend like that is to, is to customize the uh, boiling point or why some, you know, FC40 might have a really high boiling point and one of their other blends might be a lower boiling point by changing the, the length of the carbon chains in this molecule. So there's a couple unusual properties to this stuff. One is that it's very dense and has a very low viscosity. So the viscosity is similar to water but it's almost, I think it's over 1.8 times as dense as water. So when you go to pick this thing up, it's, it's really heavy. I mean, if this is just sitting on a table and you, you go to heft it, I mean, it's, it's 1.8 times heavier than what you're expecting, which is quite unusual. It's also immiscible with water. It has extremely low solubility in water and vice versa, so that um, if, you, if you, you know, spill it into something that's wet or whatever, it really doesn't mix. I've got a a little test tube here with a little bit of fluorinert in here and I'm going to put some water in. Let's see what happens. So as you can see it's quite separated and um, with shaking you can get some bubbles that form at the interface here but the fluorinert, I'm sorry there you go, the fluorinert is on the bottom layer and the water is, is up here and uh, even with shaking you can see it, it's kind of like an oil and water type interface there and it quickly settles out. So you may have heard of fluorinert from uh, the movie The Abyss. Uh, there's a scene in the movie where uh, a pet rat is held underneath a uh, liquid, like held in a cage underneath a vat of liquid and uh, the scientist who's doing this is explaining that the liquid can carry oxygen into the rat's lungs. So this is actually the chemical that they were talking about. It is fluorinert and underwater breathing or liquid breathing is actually a real thing. Um, rats can breathe underwater or it's <laughs> under fluorinert rather, oxygenated fluorinert, uh, but they typically don't live more than a day or two afterwards. So it's not exactly a um, something you'd want to try at home, let's just say. Uh, I don't think I'm even going to try it on a rat because it's, it's, we kind of know what's going to happen, but it is interesting nonetheless that this fluid can dissolve enough oxygen such that if you breathe this into your lungs, enough oxygen will be transferred into your bloodstream uh, to, to allow normal respiration, or at least close to normal respiration. Basically just like fluid in the womb. I mean, it's, it's the same system there, although you don't have fluorinert in wombs as far as I know. So I was thinking of some interesting experiments to do with this that didn't involve uh, breathing, and I thought, well, since it has a high boiling point, and it doesn't interact with water and doesn't react and, and uh, doesn't break down, it might make an interesting frying fluid. So to start, I, I first wanted to do a control with, with normal canola oil. So I set up a beaker on my hot plate and filled it up with canola oil and then placed a, a, thermo, a, a temperature probe in it and added a stir bar just to keep the temperature as even as possible and brought it up to temperature. Now the to make this sort of a comparable uh, comparison, I wanted to use the same temperature for both fluids. 
So the FC40 boils at about 330 degrees F. So I wanted to keep the temperature well under that, or 320F, I think. So I wanted to keep it well under that for the oil as well. So I cut some potato, some potato uh, pieces off, made some very thin chip-like things, and uh, dunked them into the hot oil. And I was going to just measure the time it took to, to brown it properly, and then use the same time for the floor inert bath. So that all went pretty well, and I got a pretty decent looking potato chip, and that was about 300, 300 degrees F after the temperature came down, after I put the chip into the oil, and it cooked for about 3 minutes 30 seconds. So next up, I loaded up the floor inert into another flask, and also brought it up to temperature, and then put a chip in there, and fried it. And surprisingly, it worked really well. I, it behaved well. There was no, uh, you know, reacting or popping or anything like that. Uh, the vapor from the floor inert flask was really easy to deal with. At first, I was worried that if it started to boil, it would uh, give off lots and lots of vapor. Uh, but the vapor is so heavy that it stays in the flask, and it wasn't boiling vigorously enough to really, you know, you, you could kind of see where the vapor was going, and it wasn't uh, a large quantity of it. So when I took the chip out of the floor inert, Lo and behold, it's, it's uh, crispy. It's almost like a baked potato chip, like a baked, uh, you know, they sell baked potato chips in the stores, although I don't think they cook them in floor inert. And it's completely fat free, since there's no fat in the potato to begin with. They're extremely low amounts. And there's no fat in the floor inert. Uh, there's no way that you can gain fat in the cooking process. So it's a totally fat free potato chip. But it crunches just like a fried potato chip and uh, it's browned just like a fried potato chip, so <laughs> this is pretty cool. Now, if you're wondering if I've eaten one of these, no, actually I um, was a little worried that the floor inert might decompose and introduce a substance that I would not want to eat. Uh, maybe I get your comments on this one, since I'm not too confident that eating this thing would be a great idea. Okay, well I'm sure I'll have lots of other interesting experiments to do with this. See you next time. Bye.